Hi, thanks for listening today. Um, thanks for spending some time with me. Uh, I'm going to play a couple of my favorite solos from Mahler's Fifth Symphony. This is the, uh, the first lyric solo from uh, the first movement, and then I'll also play the, uh, a, a short lyric solo from the third movement as well. Uh, let me just go ahead and do that. So that's the first one. I like it, but it's, um, it's a great thing to throw into the mix of your practice. Um, even if you're not uh, intending to play in an orchestra, it's still a valuable thing to work on because it's such a beautiful melody. And uh, there's some Mahler-isms in it, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. This particular uh, episode might be more for people who are uh, preparing this for an orchestra and can already play it. I'm not going to talk too much about technical things, which I sometimes do, um, or the physical challenges involved in playing the trumpet, more about the musical expression. Now, right at the beginning, it says espressivo. It also says pianissimo. So this is a problem for a lot of people. We look at that and we go like, oh, gee, I've got to play really soft. You know, it's, that's, that's hard. And we're not thinking about the quality of our voice. We're not thinking about um, uh, reaching out with the sound and touching the people who are listening in the audience. Uh, we may not be thinking about playing with others in the orchestra. Now, this one was very interesting for me, so uh, one for me, so because I've, I've played it a number of times, and um, and once I had a conductor ask me if I could sound more like a horn. So I had just played it on my C trumpet, and I was like, okay, how do I make the C trumpet sound like a horn? I'll show you that in a second. <laughs> But uh, first, I want to I uh, have you listen for certain things that are very, very characteristic in Mahler's music, and it, and it carries through all his pieces, and it's something that you're going to see the notation for on a regular basis. So the first section, pianissimo, what do you get? The, the, this, to me, this solo is a lament. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's got crying in it. It's, it's, it's got... Um, you know, it's it's a it's a song that's very mournful, and so I'm trying to get at that, and I think that's exactly what Mahler had in mind. So there are no markings in the first section, and then he starts using accents, tenuto markings, and crescendos and decrescendos. So I want to spend a little time looking at that. If you're listening carefully, first in the first phrase where there are no dynamic markings except for pianissimo, I'm using what you might call phrasing dynamics. And this is something that comes from your imagination. It's not, don't think of it as a physical thing. Think of it as, if you were singing it, how would you sing it? If you were conducting it, how would you, how would you conduct it? Especially in terms of where the emphasis is and where, where, where the emphasis is placed and then how it's, how it's released. So the first two notes are a pickup. So it's, Da, da, di, da, da. Then you have to decide how much am I carrying a, a, a longer note and, and how am I carrying it? Am I releasing it through the carrying of the note? Or, or am, I, am I driving it through the carry? Am I carrying to someplace? And th this sounds very analytical. Be analytical when you're listening and get it in your imagination and then bring that, bring that with you. So I'm going to play through this out of tempo, which I often do. Um, and the idea here is, can I get the basic shape, shapes of the line? The shape comes from where there's emphasis and where there's, where there's release. So as I do that a number of times, and if you have trouble with this, record it. Um, you can also try and sing it if that helps. I find that I was gesturing a lot before. I find that conducting also helps. 
um, because I'm thinking about where, where, how am I hearing where the emphasis is in the music. So uh, once you know that, you're always blowing to someplace. Even when you're releasing the note, you're following through. You're always carrying the note when, when there's a diminuendo. And of course, that gives you a lot more control. So a lot of people have problems in this one when they see that pianissimo from holding back and trying to control the sound, trying to control the air. Um, and, and you really can't play it expressively that way. So if it's hard for you to play it at a gentler dynamic, and by the way, it doesn't have to be what you might think of as pianissimo in the in performance. It's more like mezzo piano. But what does that mean? Well, it's all about context. So actually think more in terms of the voice. Now here's where this uh, one particular conductor asked me to play it like a horn. So what did I do? Well, I happen to have um, a mouthpiece um, that is a flugelhorn mouthpiece that uh, has a trumpet shank on it. So I can put that in my trumpet and it changes the color a little bit. Um, this was made for me by Gary Radke, uh, who's been a good friend for a long time. And uh, he also made one for Wayne Bergeron and Wayne called it his career saver. And I haven't talked to Wayne about that, but I think what he means is when he's getting this, he just puts the other mouthpiece in and that takes the edge off the sound. And let's see if you can hear it. I'm not sure with my recording setup if you'll be able to, but maybe it'll work. You get the idea? Now, if that's not enough, then you might want to try playing some of these things on a different instrument. You could use a cornet. Um, in this case, I'm going to try my flugelhorn. <laughs> of course, now your transposition is different. And I realize I'm picking up this horn and it is cold. Thanks for giving me a chance to warm up a little bit. Now let's see if I can um, if I can play this with the with the trans transposition. I'm not used to playing it on a B flat instrument. the sound but it's a lot harder to play on this instrument for me the pitch is a problem you probably heard some notes that were the meh, not so good um, but it's a great thing to practice so if you have a cornet pick it up play it on cornet if you have a flugel play it on the flugel horn play it on your B flat trumpet play it on different instruments even try some of the higher horns and the goal here is you're waking up your brain um, you're playing it in different transpositions um, you're getting the music in your mind and directly into your body so that you're not, you're not just playing it the same way over and over again, which is what so many of us do. Okay, that's enough of the flugelhorn. I'll be curious to see what it sounds like on the recording. I haven't tested this out, so this is a, this is a premiere here. <laughs> um, so things to watch for. When I'm crescendoing, when I'm leading to some place, and, and then I'm decrescendoing, in Mahler, the crescendos uh, it sometimes can be confusing. I'm looking at here where um, there's a decrescendo, and then a bar later there's another decrescendo, and a bar later there's another decrescendo, and a bar later there's another decrescendo. So this is simple, and many of you already know this, but for those of you who are not aware, this is the ebb and flow. He's looking for a shape. So when you see a decrescendo and another decrescendo, it doesn't mean get softer and softer. It means come back up to a certain level, a certain level of intensity, where you can release again. 
there are all these sighing, sighing movements, I guess you'd say. And that's what you want to pick up on. So it's this ebb and flow of intensity. When I hear people play this, when I hear my students play it, it's generally one intensity all the way through. And that's because it's easier to have control on the trumpet when you keep things pretty much the same. You know, you're always energizing it, you're always blowing through, you're always you know, keeping that air moving, um, you're always being very determined about getting the sound out, out there and projecting. And actually that, that we need to learn how to trust the sound, to release it, to let the resonance go out into the hall, and, uh, and practice the skills necessary in order to get this nuance. If you don't have that, then it's, it's not gonna be very satisfying to listen to. This can be a heartbreaking solo when you play it really, really well. I'm, I'm afraid that my renditions today were mediocre, but I hope some of that, that emotion came through. That's what we're aiming at here. Um, let me look at the other solo. This is from the third movement. And uh, uh, let's see how this goes. So that's a quick one. Let me do it once again. As I do it, I want you to listen for something. Listen for what I was just talking about. So I'm going. I have this lilt, it's in three. Ah, I forgot to mention this. So that's a, that's a perfect example of the kinds of things that Mahler does, and that's what I want to encourage you to practice when you're working on these, these delicate, lyrical, highly nuanced solos. That's what makes Mahler work. Um, one of the better compliments I got from one of my students who went to a performance that I was playing of this piece said, it, it sounded like Mahler. <laughs> and that's really our goal. Can we get what he was feeling? Can we get the, the sentiment, the, 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 the passion you know, of the emotion uh, in there. And that's hard. We got enough to worry about just playing the trumpet. And that's where most of us are stumbling a little bit. So again, make that easier for yourself. And a good way to do that is just exaggerate a little bit. So, and play with it. You don't have to do it the way I'm saying or the way, or the way I'm playing it. You can do it many different ways and still get a result that's, uh, that seems right to you. When you get something that's right to you, you believe it, it means something to you and you, and you trust that then when you play it in an audition or in a performance, it's gonna be with authority. It's your authority, it's your voice, it's your choice about how you're doing it. So don't think of this as a prescription or a formula. This is, should be an ex exploration. Uh, I'm gonna play through this fast again and, and see if I can make those gestures. So that time I exaggerated the dynamics a little bit. This is great to play with. See what you can do, challenge yourself physically. When it's difficult, when you're not successful, don't keep playing it over and over again. Go back to a, a comfort level. Maybe you wanna play it a little bit louder. In a performance, it actually might be closer to that volume. So don't restrict yourself. You're looking for freedom. You're looking for freedom of expression and freedom of uh, 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 gracefulness in the physical control so that it doesn't feel like anything is constrained. So I think that's enough to take a look at today and I hope you've 
um, will enjoy playing around uh, with these wonderful musical examples. Um, so go practice, and I'll see you the next time, I hope. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye-bye.